everyone, Alexa Dunn here, and today I am going to be talking about thriller structure and pacing. In particular, I'm going to break it down by Kindle percentage or any e-reader percentage to tell you at what points in your manuscript, approximately, you should be hitting your major plot twists. Once I go over that structure, then I'm going to give you a couple of quick tips for how to build and thread your suspense between and up to those points. I do have an entire video on essential thriller beats, which I will link to down below. That one's going to be more in depth and give you a much more blow by blow of all the possible beats, including some of the quieter moments that you need to write. But this is all about your high octane, aha, twisty moments, the major ones. Because thrillers are at their heart formulaic. Readers who love thrillers expect to hit these certain big beats. They expect to have something semi-big that really kicks you into the investigation or similar happen right before act two. They expect something, some kind of reveal or twist in the middle, but they also expect it's not going to be the big twist of your book because all thriller readers, we are reading to that 70% climax twist, the big twist of the book. And if you're not hitting these points, it can make for a frustrating reading experience for a thriller reader. And you might not have so much a thriller, but it could be more of a slow burn suspense if you're not exactly hitting these beats. That said, these beats still work even if it is a slower burn suspense. These beats will still work if you're not writing a thriller. These are actually just good places to follow for building suspense in any kind of story, whether it's fantasy or a romance or a sci-fi or a historical or what have you. Just kind of the flavor and nature of these kind of big moments will change depending on your genre, and I'm just focusing on thrillers specifically, which by their nature do need to be more fast paced and do need to be more high octane and exciting. So these main big twists should fall at approximately 30%, 50%, and 70%. Literally, you can throw a book on your Kindle or your e-reader of choice and turn on the thing at the bottom of the screen where you can see what percentage of the book you are at. I encourage you to do this as you are reading other books. Pay attention to when the big moments happen because if you read enough thrillers, specifically well-written good thrillers, you will notice, oh, this thing just happened. I bet I'm at 30% and you look and you are, or hmm, this feels like 50% even if you weren't paying attention to where you were. You should be able to look at the bottom corner of the screen and it should approximately hit this. Obviously it can be 72% or 48%, but it needs to be pretty close to 30, 50, 70. With an asterisk, I have something to say about the 80 and 90% as well. Now, these percentages line up more or less in a three-act structure to existing beats. So your 30% is going to approximately be your break into two. Your 50% is going to be approximately your midpoint turn because it, it's the middle of the book. And your 70% is often going to be the break into three and that kind of 80 to 90% exception I mentioned, that is sometimes your literal climax. It is going to depend on the structure of your thriller. In some thrillers, the big, big twist is 70%, but in some, the 70 is more like a break into three, and then your climax is at the 80%, and so the break into three 70% twist is more of a, it propels you to the actual twist in the climax. I'm going to talk more about it, but there's a tiny bit of wiggle room there, but if something big, the big shoe dropping in your thriller doesn't happen between 70 and say 85%, maximum 90, but that's really pushing it because it usually implies that you're rushing your ending, you have a problem. Okay, so I'm going to dive into each one, starting with the 30% mark twist. Now, you might be thinking, why hasn't she brought up the inciting incident? The inciting incident is very, very important, but the inciting incident is going to be different in different types of books and in different types of thrillers. In some thrillers, indeed, your inciting incident is actually going to be your first so-called twist. That's going to happen between like 10% and 15 to max 20% because an inciting incident is the thing that 
kicks off the action of the book. But in some thrillers, the inciting incident, it's a slower burn book. The inciting incident is a thing that marks change, but it's not actually the thing that pushes the reader into act two, the twist that pushes the reader into act two. So the inciting incident and that act two twist are separate things that do work together. But because the inciting incident twist varies in structure, the one that really matters is 30%. You can get away with a slower burn beginning to your thriller as long as you smack them in the face with a really good break into two at approximately 30%. It is a twist moment or revelation that changes the status quo and propels the investigator character, the main character, forward into your thriller suspense plot. It is that moment that often presents the so-called crucible. It is the thing that ties the character to the whole plot, to the story. It's the point of no return twist, the first major revelation where the reader and often the character goes, oh shit. This is where your book should really become a page turner because think about it, the 30% to the 50%, there's not a lot in there. You're doing your promise of the premise, you're doing your fun and games, you're like loading in some really good juicy thriller stuff in your act two, and this is where your book is going to become a page turner. Very often that oh shit 30% thing, it can be a secret that the victim had that changes the texture of the whole kind of plot thrust or the investigation. If you have a ticking clock mechanism of any time, this is going to be kind of the first turning of the screw in that ticking clock mechanism. So say your ticking clock mechanism, you're going to employ, say, a blackmail plot. If you don't do X by Y, I reveal your secrets. This 30% oh shit would usually be, ooh, the main character didn't take it seriously and they reveal the first secret. Or let's say it's the kind of ticking clock where the killer is going to start killing people. That 30% oh shit is the first victim dies. So yeah, think of it as the first oh shit moment. That That's what we're going to go for with this one. Now next is the 50% twist or the midpoint turn. So this is, I mean, they're all, they all should be oh shit moments to be perfectly frank, but this is the one that should be a total reversal or game changer on top of the first one. But your 50% thing should almost be a reversal on whatever your 30% thing was. It should shift the status quo dramatically for the reader and the characters that is also inevitably propelling them toward whatever your 70 to 80, 90% twist is. It's your, oh man, I thought that first secret was bad, but here at 50%, I find out it's worse than I thought, or that bad thing was obscuring a worse thing. If it's that ticking clock thing, they are now taking it very, very seriously. They are paying attention to the blackmail or victims are falling. The 50% twist could be, the killer isn't who we thought they were. The next victim is the person who we thought did it. Giving you a specific example, say your 30% twist was your victim was having an affair. Well, maybe your 50% twist is actually, it's not that simple. They were having an affair in order to blackmail the person that they were sleeping with. And actually they were a master blackmailer. It's kind of turning the screws and reversing what you thought you knew. Or in a book that has multi POVs, this is a really good place to totally switch up the game. That 50% twist could be a brand new POV that changes everything, for example. Midpoint turns are great places to do huge story shifts. Sometimes it's changing the setting entirely. I read a book recently that not only had shifting POVs, but it totally in the middle changed the status quo of the entire story. Up to that point, it was kind of like a slow burn, something bad's gonna happen. The bad thing happened and then the second half of the book was essentially completely different. So you can use your midpoint turns to really throw a shock of cold water in your reader's face. But I do want to talk about slow burn examples. I read another one recently because I now pay attention to the percents of every single thriller I read because I find it really interesting. And I read a suspense book that was a lot more of a slow burn and you can do this. Not everything has to be game changing shock. And I got to about the 50% and I was like, there hasn't been like a game changing twist. And I kind of passed 50% and I had to think about it. Slower burn book. And I realized, aha, 
around 50%, what happened is the three different POV characters all came together and what got more complicated was their personal relationships. In this particular case, in this book, they all get drunk and there's extra levels of flirtation and it's kind of a tightening of the screws. It's not really a twist, but it represented an escalation in the story that propelled the entire narrative toward act three. Essentially, think of the 50% twist, that it can be something that recontextualizes the entire story for the reader. So in that slow burn, it was like, aha, this is where the story is going. It's gonna get sloppy, messy with romance, and who only knows what that's gonna do to act three. Now, the 70% twist, as I mentioned, this is usually gonna be your break into three. It's gonna be that linchpin moment that inevitably propels the main character forward to the climax. You can make this a game-changing twist for the main character where they have to completely discount an entire line of investigation and regroup and rethink, and that regrouping and rethinking propels them toward the bad guy, whether the main character knows it or not. That example I used earlier, let's say you're in like a, and then there were none situation where the person that everyone assumed was the bad guy is the next victim. It can work as, as a midpoint turn, but it can also work as a break into three. I, I want you to think that really the twists and how you structure them, it's different in every book. The important thing is that you have these beats and moments. And so if you decide to have your killer fake out work as a break into three rather than a midpoint turn, you just have to have something else work as your midpoint turn. You can't have a 30% twist and then nothing until 70%. That indicates an act two problem. Essentially, whatever you have happen at 70%, it has to be game-changing enough that it propels the main character to make some kind of choice, and it's usually a bad choice. But this is where I want to talk about your 80%, 90%. As I mentioned, it's going to differ thriller to thriller. In some thrillers, the 70% twist is the reveal of the big solution, but then the 80 to 90%, it's like a wham to punch, where it's like, ha, yes, you knew the killer, but the twist at 80 to 90% is the real reason they did it, and it's the motive, which is kind of the other shoe that's dropping. Or, yeah, I gave you a big twist at 70% telling you who the killer is. This happened in a recent book that I read, and I thought, this feels like too soon. How How is the rest of this gonna suspend? itself. But then it was the escalation of, oh, how is this character going to get out of this situation and are they going to die? And so the further like kind of tightening at 80, 90 percent was escalations on the imminent danger to that character. So another thing that a lot of thrillers do is the 70 percent twist is like a fake out twist to whatever the 80 to 90 percent climax moment really is. And you can totally do that. The 70 percent revelation, let's say you do, it was Nancy all along, whoever Nancy is. And like, you've made it really convincing that it's Nancy and she goes after Nancy. And then your 80 to 90% like gut punch twist on the twist is, oh, it was the main character's boyfriend all along and Nancy was a fake out and he orchestrated the whole thing. So the 70% can be a substantial twist, a very believable twist. And then you can basically use that as a fake out and make sure that at 80, 85, as I mentioned, 90 is pushing at percent, you drop the real big like face punch in the climax. Essentially, whether it's 70%, 80%, 85, or 90%, be careful with 90%, as I mentioned, because it can sometimes mean a rushed ending. Whatever you do in that percentage, it's the big reveal that is the point of the whole book. It's everything the reader has been reading towards. So you want to make sure you get it in that point. I'm going to talk about the caution of 90%. Every once in a while, we see the mistake of if it hits at 90% and the climax goes to 95%, then it just ends. And that's kind of bad. So percentage wise, definitely pay attention. The closer you edge to 90 and past 90%, you are more likely to have a problem with your ending. And I just don't want you to forget the ending because rushing an ending in a thriller, I think is a huge no-no. It can really, really ruin a thriller. So just be very, very careful. You don't wanna hold your big, big thing to the very last minute. 
exception to this is the final twist in, in a thriller. You know that thing where on the last page you get like the final, final twist? You are allowed to do that, but you still have to have that kind of climax moment between 70 and say 85% that should solve reasonably, let's say 99% of things. It should deliver that satisfaction to the reader. And then you are allowed to do that 1% final, final twist on the final page. That is an exception. Now this brings me to those tips that I promised you. So as I mentioned, between all this, you, the magician writing the story, and I will tell you, this is, this is the hard part. It's very, very hard. You have to string all of these brilliant suspense threads between these big moments. It shouldn't just be big moments. You can have tons of little big moments between those percentage marks. And so I just wanted to give you some of my top tips for how to do that threading and development work to come up with these big moments and then have all the stuff in between. So my first one, I actually have an entire video on, so I am gonna link to that down below, and that is coming up with the plot behind the plot. It's essentially working backwards ahead of time with your antagonist, whoever did it, whatever it is. You need to know point for point everything that they've been doing before your story starts and throughout the whole thing behind the scenes. And this is gonna help you come up with subtle little moments and misdirections and red herrings and foreshadowing throughout the book. So check out that video for far more details on how to do that, but that's one thing that's definitely gonna help you threading between these major points. My second tip is to constantly and almost to an annoying degree, keep track of your story questions and your character's questions. These are, they're, sometimes they're the same thing and sometimes they're different. Essentially, thrillers are a constant asking and answering of questions. It's reader questions, it's story questions, it's character questions. And in any given scene, basically from the inciting incident on, but especially from that 30% twist, that break in to do twist on. Every single scene and chapter that you write, you should have a running list of questions. It should be, what does my character know? What do they want to know? What do they think they know? What do they need to find out or know or experience or see or question in order to get them to the next scene where I need them to find out X? Beyond the character questions, it's what is really going on here? What is that other character thinking? Who are my red herrings here? The reader, you're keeping track of what does the reader know? What is the reader probably thinking is going on? What do I want them to think? Misdirection is very, very important. And how can I do that? Now, this is very overwhelming. Even telling you all of this, I'm kind of like, I can't believe I do this on books without crying. Actually, you're allowed to cry. It is overwhelming if you take it in whole, but it's all about breaking it down bit by bit. Use this in chunks of your manuscript. It can literally just be scene to scene. What are the questions for this one moment of the story? What is the next beat that comes? And how do I get from A to B? If you take it slowly one step at a time, always making sure that you have your kind of essential scene, story, and character, and reader questions, that's how you're going to successfully accomplish layering in lots of things. Now, this can be in drafting, but honestly, you're allowed to do a ton of this in editing. This includes if you've written a thriller and you're trying to hit these beats, and you realize, let's say you realize you're off by a bit with maybe where some of these things are falling, you can actually use taking the thing that happen between, let's say you have a 30% and a 50% beat, but they're falling at 25 and say 55. You need to push one back and one forward, kind of. So you can look at everything that comes be right before and in between those, asking scene by scene, chapter by chapter story questions in order to add or tighten things. You basically don't need any scenes or moments that aren't going to either address questions or ask new ones, help you ask new ones. Essentially what this whole question thing is, it's all about story logic 
and reader experience and kind of the sleight of hand that you're trying to pull off. I hope I explained that well. This is how I get through my moments in these thrillers. Like I'm writing and I go, I know that my midpoint turn is X and I know that I am here. So what are the list of things my character knows and things they need to know so that I can develop all of the stuff that's going to come in between? And the third tip is also kind of an intense one, and this is kind of like, I call them story threads, suspense threads. Uh, it's a little intense, but what you can do, if, you're re if you love organization and outline-y type stuff, this is actually for you, and you just really wanna go into the weeds on your story, this tip can help. First of all, take the plot behind the plot tip and literally beat out, like do an outline, a timeline for the plot behind the plot with your antagonist. Next, you can do basically a scene by scene or chapter by chapter breakdown of cause and effect. Everything that your character does and what happens. Basically, the questions that are asked, the questions that are answered, the new questions that come out of that. It's like your character speaks to the detective. The detective lets slip a detail here. That leads your character to go talk to a bookshop owner. The bookshop owner is a dead end, but while they're there, they notice a car outside. It's the cause and effect of everything that happens in kind of your thread. This is especially useful in Act 2, and you can basically line them up. I also highly recommend you do this for your A plot and your B plot. Your A plot is your main thread that diverges with the actual antagonist, the what is actually happening main thing that the character needs to solve. But you're also going to have a B plot. Now B plots should slot in and work in tandem with your A plots. These can be romances, these can be side investigations, it can be red herrings, but you should kind of plot them out separately and then line all these things up. You don't have to do all of them, by the way, this is kind of pick and choose, but it's your plot behind the plot. It's your cause and effect thread. It's your A plot versus your B plot. And you should look at them with the kind of major beats, those 30%, 50%, 70 to 85% twists, and see how everything is lining up. You can use this to see where you're overcomplicating things, where you're dragging out your pacing, where things aren't complicated enough. You can find new opportunities for foreshadowing, for red herrings. Because at the end of the day, your thriller isn't just an A plot where some big twists happen. It is this intricate and layered dance, and it can be really, really overwhelming. So I hope this helped. It's an overview of essential pacing and structure for thrillers, but also hopefully some tips that help you with layering things together. I have other videos on thrillers and I will link to that playlist down below. Let me know down below in the comments any questions you have about writing thrillers, about thriller pacing, thriller beats, my gobbledygook about story questions, anything that you are curious about, and give this video a thumbs up if you like it, and I will make more videos about writing and editing thrillers. And if you're not already subscribed to the channel, go ahead and do that. I post new videos two to three times a week. As always, guys, thank you so much for watching, and happy writing.